ladies and gentlemen. Um, thank you very much to the organizers for the opportunity to share some thoughts on a topic which I'm sure all of you are um, asking yourselves, how on earth is he going to deal with such a complex topic and not step on any toes? Well, in order to be able to do that, I have a disclaimer, and that is to say I'm not pushing any agenda, I'm not favoring any particular um, sex or gender or sexual orientation. My job here as a scientist is simply to present to you the data, to present to you information in a context that I hope will allow you um, to look at this in a way which is perhaps more objective. So I'd like to begin um, with this slide. In fact, what I'd like to do before I address this slide is to ask you to look at the people to your left and to your right and get a sense of the color of their eyes and the texture and uh, color of their hair. Okay, I see some people are crossing gender boundaries here, but that's fine. Okay, so what I really want to do is to, is to use the slide and the exercise you've just performed to point out to you that we are all different. That there is nothing that is common between us except our genomes. We have about, as, I, as I'll come to in a minute, we have about a 99.9% .9 similarity in the DNA that makes us who we are. But in essence, we're all different. You'll see that the people on this slide have hair which is of different lengths, different textures, their eyes are different, the skin color is different. And all of this is determined by, from um, DNA which is situated in our cells, and these cells make up all of the different organs of our bodies. And this is just, a, again, an array of differences between different individuals. So what is the information that drives these differences? Well, this information sits in the nucleus of our cells. And as you know, we have cells that make up our bodies, which are called somatic cells. And we have cells that make up our gametes, eggs and sperm. These are chromosomes, which are condensations of the DNA, which we see only at the time that the cell divides. But in fact, this DNA is a very complex molecule. Here you can see the famous double helix, which won Watson and Crick the Nobel Prize about 60 years ago. But this is then intricately wound around structures here called histones, and then secondary and tertiary and quaternary structures. So you get a massive amount of information which is squeezed into the nucleus of every single cell in our bodies. Now, in fact, this information constitutes uh, 3 times 10 to the 9, that is nine, 3 billion base pairs of DNA from each of our parents. And if you put that together, that's 6 billion base pairs of DNA strung together, as you can see here, and squeezed into the nucleus of every single cell. So what is it in this DNA that makes us who we are? Well, this is what it is. Okay, It's our genes. And we have about 25,000 genes. We have an equal number from our mothers and from our fathers. And this is then what gives rise to what you see around you, the people around you. It gives rise to the structure and function. It controls everything we feel. It controls all our thoughts. Um, and will be very important in the discussion as we go ahead. But, of course, the age-old argument is it's not only the DNA, it's not only our genes. And this gives rise to the age-old paradigm of nature versus nurture. So we've had a look, very briefly, at the nature component, that is to say, the component that we inherit from our mothers and our fathers, and you've heard it said many times before, we can't choose our mothers and our fathers, and therefore we have to just live with what we're given. But this DNA then interacts with the environment, and I'll give you an example of, our, of how that occurs in a minute, to give rise to the final product. And in scientific jargon, we call that the phenotype. 
So this would be the genotype, this is the DNA, this is the environment, and this then gives rise to the final product, which is what you see around you, and it's what you are and how you function. So the question is, how does this environment then impact on the DNA? And there are many studies that have been done uh, to address this, and I'm going to focus here on a topic which is called epigenetics. So you're familiar with the classical topic of genetics, where you inherit certain mutations or you inherit certain variants from mothers and fathers. But epigenetics goes above that. In other words, it doesn't affect the DNA, uh, the, the, the code of the DNA, but it produces chemical changes on that DNA. So let me give you an example. It's well known that a pup that is raised by an anxious and low-nurturing mother becomes an anxious adult. On the other hand, a pup that is raised by a relaxed and high-nurturing mother becomes a relaxed adult. And I think this doesn't only uh, apply to rats, I'm sure you will agree. And so the question is, how does the environment, so the environment in this case being the nurturing behavior of the mother, how does the environment then impact on the DNA? And let me say that these changes that occur to the DNA, which again are not changes in the code, but they're chemical changes, can be transmitted from one generation to the next. So the effects of the environment cause these chemical changes and can be transmitted. And this has given rise to a whole field of um, epigenetics. And the chemistry, very simplified, is shown um, in this slide over here. So here is a gene, one of the 25,000 genes that I showed you earlier. When the gene is expressed, let's take collagen, for example, which is something you're very familiar with that makes up skin and bones. When that gene is expressed, the protein collagen is made and it goes into making us who we are. We can, however, repress the expression of that gene, as is shown here, um, by this red arrow. And that happens when these chemical changes occur on the DNA. And we just happen to call these methylation. Uh, for the non-scientists, it's just a chemical change. For the scientists, I'm sure you know exactly what I'm talking about. Okay, so how does this then relate to the story that I told you about earlier about nurturing of pups? Well, here's a very interesting example. In, in rodents, there is a process called maternal licking and grooming. So in humans, we do something, we don't lick our, our infants, but you will see the analogy. Um, now, in high licking and grooming, this happens to be a sequence of DNA which codes for a receptor in a certain part of the brain. In high leaking and grooming, that DNA remains unaltered. The protein is expressed and it can serve its function, which ultimately will be related to making the pups that come from these mothers relaxed and sociable animals. However, if there is low leaking and grooming, Certain chemical changes, as I pointed out to you earlier, methylation, occur on the DNA. This prevents this protein from being synthesized in this particular part of the brain. And when that protein is not expressed, these pups now become anxious and have difficulty socializing. So what I've tried to show you here, on the one hand, is the nature component of what makes us who we are, that is to say the DNA which carries all of this information. And on the other hand is the nurture component, which is the environment, which is not just something nebulous that happens in a vacuum and we sort of have an idea. It's not at all. It's very precise. We know exactly, in many cases, not in all cases, but in many cases, how the environment impacts on the DNA and then gives rise to the final phenotype or the final product, which is you and me. And remember, both of these, the genetics, or the nature, and the epigenetics, or the nurture, can be transmitted. So they're both heritable. Okay, now the important thing is these epigenetic marks are acquired during the course of the development. So I pointed out to you that we have 25,000 genes. So the question is, how do we end up with the different cell types that you are familiar with? So we have cells in our skin, we have hair, we have uh, eyes, we have things that you know that go on inside, gut, etc. We have about 250 different cell types in our bodies. 
And what happens during development is that these 25,000 genes are selectively expressed in different ways to give rise to these 250 different cell types. So you start off with a fertilized egg, which can become every tissue in the body, and slowly during development, this egg then acquires different specializations until you end up with a final product. <coughs> in order to do this, you have to switch off certain genes and you have to leave other genes switched on. And this then happens through a process of epigenetics. However, when it comes to formation of the gametes, that is to say egg and sperm in the embryo, you have to clean the DNA. You have to get rid of all of those epi marks. Otherwise, you're going to transmit all of those signals onto the embryo, and the embryo is going to be totally confused because now it can't make all the different specialized cells. You've given it a blueprint uh, which was inherited from the previous generation. So at that point, all of the epi marks are removed. And the other time during development when this happens is at the moment of fertilization. When the egg and the sperm meet, any epi marks that remain on the DNA are, in effect, uh, wiped clean. Now, the interesting thing about what makes us who we are is that none of these processes work to complete efficiency. Okay, and that goes for the whole of biology. As we say, there is never a never in biology or in medicine. And so, in some cases where this process is not fully efficient, and it happens most of the time, some of these epi marks are carried over whereas they should have, in fact, been erased. And I'll come back to this notion a little bit later. Okay, so you may have seen from the marketing, um, I'm going to address today's talk uh, by looking at different elements of what compose, uh, which are the determinants of gender and sexual diversity. And what I'd like to do is to ask you please to see these as three separate processes that operate relatively independently and by the end, what I hope to have shown you is that any permutation that you can possibly imagine of these three different processes does exist in every single society to varying degrees. Okay, it's very, very important to the central theme of this discussion. So the first part that I'm going to address is physical sex. So if you look at me, okay, I... I think you would agree that I'm, I'm male. Okay, so my physical sex is male. You can't see all of me, but let me guarantee, let me reassure you. <laughs> let me reassure you, I'm biologically male. <laughs> so the next one is psychological sex. How do I identify? Do I identify as being male on one end of the spectrum? Do I identify as being female? Or do I identify as something that's in between? So in a heteronormative society, a society which only accepts um, heterosexual interactions and behavior and definitions, it's binary. It's either male or female. And we know that that's not what happens in life. So what I'd like you to think about here is a spectrum from male to female with many permutations in between. So the third issue that I'll talk about is sexual orientation. In other words, are we attracted to male energy or are we attracted to female energy? Irrespective of the body in which that energy resides. And it's the sum total of these three elements, which I'm going to address separately, that give rise to gender expression. In other words, it's the manifestation of who and what we are. The clothes we prefer to wear, our mannerisms, the people we prefer to interact with, the toys we play with from the moment we are children and are sufficiently coordinated to be able to do that. Okay, so it's these three which give rise to the final notion of gender expression. So let's begin then with biological sex. Think about pregnancy now in terms of three trimesters. The first three months, the second three months, and the third three months. This first part of um, physical sex or biological sex is determined in the first trimester of pregnancy. I'm going to come to psychological sex, which in fact is determined in the second trimester of pregnancy. In other words, it's not determined at the same time. You'll understand why in a minute. 
So as you know, the first thing that differentiates males from females is our gonads, either ovaries or testes. By default, they're all female. And I'm sure that would mean a lot to a lot of you. <laughs> Unless we have a Y chromosome, there's a particular gene called the SRY gene, which then drives the synthesis of um, androgens, testosterone, and that is responsible for male development. In the absence of these signals, our gonads and everything else that follows will be female. Once this is in place, then let, this then leads to the development of the internal organs and the genitalia, which are either then male or female. So this is a slide taken from Grey's Anatomy from a long time ago. Um, and you can see that as we start out during development, we go through an indeterminate phase, where if you had to look at the embryo at this phase, you can see that it has both male and female components, and we're not able to distinguish the one from the other. Um, under the influence of testosterone, it then goes on to develop male characteristics, and in the absence of testosterone, in fact, under the influence of estrogen, it then goes on to develop female characteristics. But the important thing to remember is that there is an indeterminate phase, and that this is driven by different hormones. So what are these hormones? I've alluded to them briefly. We can talk about sex hormones. So these, in fact, are steroids, steroid hormones. In males, they're androgens. In females, they're estrogens and progestogens. And what I do want to point out to you is that they're synthesized through a relatively complex process. Now, I just put this up, and I'd just like you to focus, close your eyes and look through your half-closed eyes and just focus on the colors and the images and the patterns. I really don't expect you to read this. But what I do want to point out to you is that it all starts with a molecule called cholesterol, which you may be pleased to know cholesterol is not all bad. We need cholesterol. But it results in the synthesis of glucocorticoids, so the steroids that athletes use to, to build themselves up. But in the context of our discussion, it results in the synthesis of estrogens, um, in the synthesis of progestogens, and androgens, such, such as testosterone. So just look at the complexity of this system. There are multiple molecules along the pathway, and each one of these each one of these um, boxes, colored boxes here, represents an enzyme. So these are different enzymes, part of the 25,000 genes, that are responsible for synthesizing these steroid hormones. Now, I said to you at the beginning that nothing is perfect. So imagine if you have a very slight variation in the activity of one or more of these enzymes, you're going to produce more or less of the final product, which will be estrogens or androgens, depending on what is being synthesized. The question is, is this abnormal, or is this part of normal diversity? And what I would like to suggest to you is that this is part of the normal diversity. That is no different from the differences that you see in skin, and eye color, and hair texture, and the things that we addressed at the beginning of my talk. So slight variations in the activity of these different enzymes give rise to different relative concentrations of these um, different hormones. And I did point out to you that there are six uh, steroids, but there are also a number of other hormones which you may or may not be familiar with. Now for the, these steroids to be able to work, they have to bind to a receptor, so they have to dock onto a protein inside the cell, and then they interact with the DNA. So, in addition to the variations in these different enzymes in their activity, which may give differences, nuances in the levels of the different final products, if there is anything that prevents these steroids from binding to these receptors, that's also going to then influence the final outcome of um, this whole series of events. And the question is, in our normal environment, are there things that could possibly inter interfere with us? And the answer is yes. There are a very large number of um, molecules in our natural environment, which are called endocrine disruptors, 
which have estrogenic, androgenic, anti-estrogenic, and anti-androgenic activity. So they can, in fact, interfere with the normal structure and function in our bodies by interfering with the activity of these different hormones. And I list them for you here. They're found in many everyday products, such as plastic bottles, metal food cans, detergents, food, toys, cosmetics, and pesticides, pharmaceuticals, and I list, list some of the specific ones here. You may be interested in DDT, which is used, as you know, uh, in the northern provinces to spray um, for mosquitoes to prevent malaria. And what are the effects of these, of these compounds, of these chemicals in our environment, to which we're all exposed, by the way? They affect embryogenesis. They affect early childhood development and puberty. They affect male and female fertility, and they can result in autoimmune disease, cancer, diabetes, etc. So these, there's a long list. If you go onto the World Health website, you'll find a long list of over 1,200 compounds which have been shown to influence um, steroid activity. They're called endocrine disruptors. So is that relevant to our discussion? Well, there is some work that suggests that some of these endocrine disruptors may interfere with the normal process of embryogenesis that I pointed out to you earlier that is driven by the sex hormones, androgens and estrogens. And I'd like to use this as an opportunity now to introduce what was called, previously called intersex, but is now called uh, DSDs, or Disorders of Sex Development. I have to say I prefer intersex, because I don't like the word disorder, but that's the way the medical profession has moved. So I'm going to continue with intersex, but I'm actually talking about DSDs. So what are these? These are variations in physical sex characteristics that do not fit into culturally established gender norms. Okay, so you may have people who have um, variations in their physical sex which don't fit into the, the, the patterns that are accepted by our society. In some cases, these are associated with infertility, regrettably. But what is absolutely critical here, and I'm going to address the issue of psychological uh, sex determination in a minute, is that the degree of masculinization of the genitalia, which may occur in, under these conditions, does not necessarily correlate with the degree of masculinization in the brain. And the consequences of this are very important, and I'll come back to this in a minute. The reason for this is that for many years, in fact forever, when children are born with intersex, obviously the, the parents are distressed, the medical practitioners are under a, a lot of pressure, and are forced into a situation of performing what is called normalization surgery. In other words, to bring the genitalia back to something which is acceptable to a heteronormative society. So what is the consequence? Well, the consequences in many cases are infertility, incontinence, scarring, loss of sexual pleasure, pain, mental suffering, and depression. But the most important is that you may correct or you may normalize somebody, a young child in this intersex, into a sex that is not in line with the psychological identity of that individual. And there's been a very strong backlash against this whole uh, school of activity now, uh, which has resulted, for example, in uh, Malta recently passing a law which bans normalization surgery until the individual that is affected is sufficiently old enough to make a decision for themselves. And this then avoids the problem of young children being normalized in a direction which is not in accord with their own gender identity. And I would um, urge you, there's a book that has been written recently uh, in which this whole issue is, is looked at from, a, um, from a, a very personal point of view, um, which I can tell you about afterwards. I really encourage you to read this. Okay, so what I pointed out to you in, in the beginning was that there's a, there's, a, there's a 
time difference in the determination of physical versus psychological sex. So let's now, we've addressed the physical sex issue. Let's now talk about psychological sex. So this is determined in the second trimester of pregnancy. And once again, psychological sex is, during development, by default, female. Okay. However, in order to become male, we now have to have the presence of androgens, which will drive a process which results in masculinization of the brain. In the absence of androgens, or in the presence of inhibitors, which prevent the androgens from having their effect, that masculinization does not occur, and the brain then, remail, the brain then remains um, female. So this is a very complex interaction, and involves different parts of the brain. There is a tremendous amount of experimental evidence um, that shows uh, that this process is androgen dependent. And there is a study which was published last year which has shown, interestingly, that feminization is main maintained by the active suppression of masculinization by the process of methylation that I, I showed you earlier. And that in the presence of androgens, that suppression is now lifted. And the masculinization can now express itself. So women, you're all suppressed males anxiously waiting <laughs> anxiously waiting to be methylated so that that, that male characteristic can come through. So that so that, but I think the most important thing to point out here is that by default we are all female during development until androgens are produced which allows then the brain to become masculinized. Okay, so this then is perhaps a lead into the next topic I'd like to address which is the, the issue of transsexuality. On the left hand side here you have an individual who is physically male and psychologically male, the two are aligned. And next to him, you have somebody who's physically female with a female psyche. If you had to walk past somebody in the street, you'd not be able to tell. It requires behavior of the individual for them to be able to manifest this alignment. However, as I pointed out to you in the beginning of my talk, any permutation of these three different elements that you may wish to imagine does exist. And in this case, we have a female body with, which identifies as a male psyche and in this case you have the opposite where you have a female psyche associated with the male body. So please just cast your minds back a little bit to what I've been mentioning about the need for androgens to allow masculinization to occur. So you can well imagine if during development masculinization of the body occurs, so development of testes and a penis, no internal organs related to the female. However, at the critical window between the first and second trimesters, something intervenes and prevents the androgens interacting with that part of the brain which results in masculinization. What will happen is that individual will continue to develop as being physically male, but the psyche will remain female. So I do have to just briefly open a parenthesis, just pause at this moment, and you may well be asking, um, you know, how does somebody with my background become interested in this topic? Well, let me say that I belong to a clinic at Steve Biko Academic Hospital where we see patients that suffer from a condition called gender dysphoria, which in effect is the lack of alignment between the psyche and the, and the, the physical um, identity. And we see patients virtually every month throughout the year, probably about 100 people a year, who suffer from this condition, and we take them through the whole process of transition. So why do we do that? Well, we do that because this is a very distressing situation. 
You have a situation here, you can see these parents are looking very worried, don't understand why their long-awaited son prefers to play with dolls. This is a very real situation. And the consequences of gender dysphoria are dramatic. It leads to socialization, isolation, either by choice, because the individual is very uncomfortable with themselves, or through ostracism, where the people around the individual can't relate to this inability to align the psychological to the physical sex. Relationships with parents may be impaired. Very often, family relationships are quite severely disturbed. Individuals have low self-esteem. They go on to develop anxiety and depression, suicidal ideation, and suicide attempts. And in fact, suicide in people who have gender dysphoria and runs well into double figures. So we do see this as an important situation as, as medical practitioners in which to intervene, not because we feel that we have to normalize anything, but because these individuals are desperate and they come to us for help, and they say, please help me to identify with who I believe I am. And what I can tell you about these individuals is that this component, the psyche, is invariant. So there is nothing that you can do to change the identity of that individual from a psychological point of view. And the only thing that you can do to give them peace is to take them through this process of what we prefer to call gender affirmation rather than reassignment, in which their gender is affirmed through a process which involves initially hormones and then surgery and then living as the sex with which they psychologically identify. Okay, I've come now to the third element. So I've taken you through physical sex, and I've used intersex as an example of variation. I've taken you through psychological sex, and I've used gender dysphoria as an example, again, of variation. And I'd now like to take you through sexual orientation. So as you know, there are many different ways in which one can define attraction. Some of them are listed here. And the work done by Kinsey many, many years ago put these onto a scale which goes from one to six, in which zero shows exclusively heterosexual behavior, that is to say male energy is attracted to female energy and vice versa. In a male, sorry, male energy in a male body attracted to female energy in a female body. Versus homosexual, where the energy that is attracted, the one energy that is attracted to the other is in the same physical sex, to something that is in between, and then people who manifest um, with no sexual behavior or, or are asexual. So what can I tell you about homosexuality? Well, first of all, it occurs in about 5% of individuals of both sexes in most populations. So at some point a couple of years ago, I don't remember when it was, but at some exact moment, 7 billion people inhabited this planet. So if 5% of 7 billion people are homosexual, that means 350 million people are affected on this planet. It's a lot of people that manifest an attraction to somebody of the same sex. It is familial in both males and females, so it does occur in families. However, the acid test here is whether or not it occurs in twins, and there's not a very good concordance between twins. So for many years, people were looking for the so-called gay gene, which may uh, determine homosexual behavior. And it's interesting, if you think about it, why would people look for the gay gene and not for the heterosexual gene? I've never understood that. I've never understood why people have been so obsessed with looking for the gay gene, because surely the issue here is sexual attraction. And it's not about whether it's homosexual or heterosexual. What is it, from a chemical and biochemical point of view, genetic point of view, that determines attraction? But anyway, that's the way that it has, it has evolved. And interestingly, um, people have now identified regions in the DNA through a variety of sophisticated genetic studies where there may in fact be regions that determine sexual orientation. 
Now, the fact that these regions have been identified doesn't mean they're abnormal. It doesn't mean that there are mutations in those areas. It just means that this is the area in the DNA where this has been identified. And it doesn't imply either, now that we've identified those regions, that this is a disorder. It just tells you where the information is coming from that determines attraction. So, as I've said to you, I pointed out to you the 25,000 genes, and there's been a search now for many years, I would say almost 20, 25 years, for this so-called gay gene. And the bottom line is, there is no gay gene. There is no gene, one gene, that affects people's sexual orientation, at least not in what has been sought for, and that is in attraction between same sexes. What has been identified, however, is that there's a region on the X chromosome, and remember that women have two X chromosomes and men have an X and a Y, but we all have an X chromosome, men and women. There's a region on the X chromosome that has been associated with the development of homosexuality in males. And this was confirmed again uh, about two years ago, and there's now been a second region in the DNA which has been identified, which is on chromosome 8. Now I'd like to come back to the story that I told you in the beginning about epigenetics, about the chemical changes that occur on the DNA that affect the genes that are expressed. So remember that, as I pointed out to you, when the gametes are made in the embryo, the DNA is wiped clean, and the same occurs at the moment of fertilization. So this DNA is wiped clean. Okay. Concentrate. This is, this is the current thinking about how sexual orientation <laughs> is determined. So imagine, for example, a mother and a father who are attracted to each other. So he's attracted to female energy and she's attracted to male energy. And there's an X and a Y in a man and a two X's in the female. Now, in the offspring, the man is going to pass his X chromosome onto his daughters and his Y chromosome onto his sons. Now, as I pointed out to you, there is a region on the X chromosome which may be responsible for determining sexual orientation. In this man, that region on the X chromosome, hypothetically, again, this is theory which is being tested at the moment, has been affected so that he is now attracted to his wife. If that Eki mark on the X chromosome is not erased, either at the time when the gametes are made, or at the time when the gametes fuse, at the moment of fertilization, that Eki mark will be carried over now into his daughter. And that Eki mark determines attraction of this man to his wife. But if that Eki mark is carried into his daughter, that daughter is now also going to be attracted to female energy. So that is the current thinking, hypothetical at this stage, I have to say, it has not been definitively proven, but that is the current thinking as to what determines sexual orientation in men and women. And what I would like to propose to you is, since this is transmitted from generation to generation, as I pointed out to you, um, homosexuality is familial, that this is something that is here to stay, this is part of who we are, this is part of our natural diversity. And in fact, somebody asked me uh, some time ago if, if we had to get rid of everybody on the planet who is attracted to the same sex, what would happen in the next generation? I said to them, we'd come back with 5% of people in the next generation who would manifest the same behavior. That is because these epimarks would continue to be incompletely erased. And I would like to propose that this is part of the normal, natural diversity that occurs in our population. It, it is, because 5% of people, or 350 million people on our planet are affected. 
a lot of people have asked, well, is this determined before birth or is this as a result of the things that happen after birth? And what I can say is that environmental factors may have an impact, as we pointed out, but that is prior to birth, mediated hypothetically at the moment in the theory that is being tested through epigenetics. And there is no convincing evidence that the family environment or early childhood experiences result in changes which would then alter sexual orientation. They may affect the way in which gender is expressed, but it is not believed from a biological point of view that this is determinant at this point. The other thing I would like to point out is that there's no evidence to suggest that sexual orientation is contagious. And this is this is a notion which readily, as I'll come back to a little bit later in my talk, um, has been sold um, in some of the um, African countries where legislation has been put into place against people who manifest homosexual behavior on the basis of the fact that if you spend too much time in the presence of someone that is homosexual, you are going to catch that form of behavior. Okay, so. I said to you in the beginning that I'm here to present the data to you. My objective is not to try and convince you to think one way or another. I think you're getting the idea, however, that I do see most of this as being part of natural diversity. I did point out, though, that there is, in the case of gender dysphoria, people who come to see us who ask for help because they're in trouble. So the question, then, that all of this begs is when does a variant that is to say, differences in the DNA that we inherit from our parents or that we may acquire through a lifetime, when do these differences become a disorder or a disease? What is the difference between normal variation and something that requires intervention? So if we look at variants that cause disorders or disease, these are things that cause subjective distress or suffering. I'd like to point out that most of the distress or suffering that you see in people who manifest uh, diversity in, a, in gender, whether it be any of the three elements I've spoken about, with the exception of gender dysphoria, do not come from the individual, but they come from the society in which that individual lives, which then is judgmental and passes judgment on that individual. When there is significant impairment of personal, social, or occupational, or other important areas of life, and of course, um, death is a very firm endpoint, so we, we want to avoid that. I must point out that there are positive variants, which people um, may not be aware of. For example, sickle cell anemia, which is something that occurs to a very high degree in Central Africa, um, has a whole set of problems on its own, but it is a positive variant in the sense that it, it protects against malaria. There is another um, variant which is called CCR5, which is a molecule in the immune system, and when that molecule is absent from individual such as you and myself, we become resistant to HIV. So there are positive variants, which in some contexts can, be, can cause disease, so I just want to point out to you that this notion of variance is, is really not a straightforward one, but when there are firm indications such as impairment of any, any component of life or death, it does require our intervention. When it comes from external judgment by other individuals, it does not require the intervention of medical practitioners uh, such as myself, but requires an increase in the tolerance on the part of those other individuals to reduce the suffering. So one way I'd like to illustrate this to you, this is the famous bell shape or Gaussian curve, and, and in science we talk about different deviations. This would be one, two, three, etc. standard deviation. So let's look at this now in terms of some of the things that are familiar to us. If I had to take everybody in this room and I had to line you up from there to there, with the tallest person in the middle and the shortest person on the ends, we end up with a curve that looked something like this. And the same would go for body weight. We'd end up with a curve that looked something like this. So there are many genes involved in determining height and weight. 
But the point is that if you fall in this part of the curve, one or two standard deviations, people will walk past you in the street and won't notice you because of any variation that you may have in your height or your weight. However, if you form, fall at this end of the curve or at this end of the curve, either in terms of height or weight, people are going to notice you and regrettably in many cases will begin to judge you and regrettably also in some cases will discriminate against you. And in most cases, this is not the result of the choice of the individual that is affected. This is something that you inherit from your parents. So one has to seriously question the validity of the judgment that is passed. The same is true for skin color. On the one end of the spectrum, we have people who lack pigmentation, and on the other hand, other end of the spectrum, we have people who have very dark skins. This curve, by the way, may be shifted one way or another. I've just shown it hypothetically as a bell-shaped curve. And you know that in our society, if you have people at this end of the spectrum, that they're not well accepted by society. They are discriminated against. They're accused of witchcraft, and certain parts of their body are used um, for a variety of, of reasons. Once again, it is not the choice of the individual involved to be at either end of that spectrum. Now here's an interesting, here's an interesting um, variation on the theme. I spoke about cholesterol area let's, earlier. Let's talk about cholesterol again. So if you have a very low cholesterol level, that's good for you, at least as far as your heart is concerned. Most of us are in this, this range of cholesterol here, and then there are some people that have a very high cholesterol. Again, it's not your choice as to whether or not you have high cholesterol. Believe it, diet, believe it or not, but diet has very little effect on your blood cholesterol levels. It's mainly determined genetically. But if you had to walk past somebody in the street who had a high blood cholesterol, would you notice it? No, you wouldn't. Okay. He or she may be concerned, and the medical practitioner may be concerned, their families may be concerned, but you wouldn't see that high cholesterol. So from a purely molecular point of view, there is no difference between this high cholesterol which leads to blockage of the arteries, differences in skin color, body height and weight. They're all determined by mechanisms which are similar and over which the individual has no choice. So let's then look at those 25,000 genes we spoke about earlier. For many people sitting here, you probably fall within one standard deviation, so you fall within a range of what is considered to be normal for most of those genes, but you may have one that pops out where in fact you fall on the shoulders of that curve through no choice of your own. And what are the consequences if you're on the shoulders of the curve? If it's not visible to the outside world, nobody's going to judge you. If it is visible to the outside world, you get pushed to the fringes of society. So, what has happened as far as variations in gender and um, sexual orientation are concerned is that there has been, the world is moving at two speeds. On the one hand, there is increased liberalism in some regions where people are now free to live as they want, dress as they want, behave as they want. But there are other parts of the world where there is increased conservatism. And in fact, there are seven countries in the world today where homosexual activity is punishable by death. This applies to all people that fall into the so-called LGBTI category. But it applies to all of us. It applies to every single one of us. Whether it be in gender or sexual diversity, whether it be in height, body weight, skin color, anything else that we may manifest. This form of discrimination occurs throughout the world in all of the areas of our life. And I'd like to come back to the question that I asked earlier, and that is to put this in context in the scenario in which the people that manifest these variations 
had no say and have no choice in the variations in which they live. Our South African constitution, one of the most liberal in the world and certainly the most liberal on the continent, says that one may not unfairly discriminate directly or indirectly against anyone on one or more grounds, including a whole number of things, including in there is gender, sex, and sexual orientation. So South Africa has a very progressive legislation, but there are many parts on the African continent at the moment where the legislation is moving in the opposite direction and where people, in fact, are being legislated against and discriminated against. So my take-home message before I end is to say that we need to distinguish between biological sex, physical sex, between gender identity, that is psychological sex, and sexual orientation. And as I pointed out at the beginning of my talk, and I'd like to reiterate now, any permutation that you can possibly imagine on those three elements does exist in our society, in every society, to varying degrees. And that the final expression of the individual from the point of gender and sexuality is a combination of all three of these elements. They're determined independently of one another. So I pointed out to you that physical sex is determined in the first trimester, psychological sex in the second trimester, and sexual orientation through a mechanism which for the moment is unknown, but which is hypothesized to be epigenetic. And I'd like to thank you for your attention and be very happy to take any questions that may arise from this. Thank you.